Well, howdy! Hey. All right. Hey, well, it is so good to be back here at Breakaway. I recently moved to Houston, Texas. Anybody from Houston in the room? Let me hear from you. Okay, yeah, represent. Listen, I love Houston, Texas. Okay, come on, come on. Uh, I love Houston, but I'm convinced there's no place quite like Aggieland, my friends. Uh, I'm a firm believer in it. And let me just say this, as I was thinking about tonight, I'm convinced that there's, there's really quite no place like this space, the ways that you get to spend Tuesday nights together, genuinely. Like, uh, I really believe that this room, it makes a difference in the lives of young people. Like these moments where you gather together on Tuesday nights, they matter. Like the moments that we're getting in the word of God as we worship together, they make a lasting impact. Like you're here for four years and yet you will see the effects of these moments over the course of your life. And the reason I can say, so, say all that with so much confidence is because I'm living proof. Like I used to sit right up there as a student here at Texas A&M gathering into Breakaway on Tuesday nights. I found myself time over and t- time and time again, like, man, I, I wanna know the living God. Like I had grown up in the church and yet as I gathered here on Tuesday nights, I learned that there was something different about the person of Jesus. And that it wasn't just intellectual knowledge for me to have, but there was a relationship for me to enter into. And so I'm believing in what's happening here on Tuesday nights for you Aggies. And I'm believing what's gonna happen tonight as we step into his word together. Uh, If you have a Bible, I'm gonna just read where we're going. We'll pray and then we'll jump into it, okay? But a Bible, Psalm 27, uh, this is what the passage says, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, when adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he, the Lord, will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and I'll make melody to the Lord. Let me pray for us, break away. Uh, Father, we are so grateful for this moment. And God, we don't come to you and express gratitude half-heartedly. We don't step into this moment now, God, and treat it haphazardly. Like we recognize that, Lord, as we come to hear from your word, you have something very specific that you want to speak to each and every one of us. One text applied to the lives of thousands of people individually, God. Only you can do that. And so we're believing for this moment now, not God because I have anything to offer, not God because Breakaway as a ministry has anything to offer, God, it's you and you alone that has the, 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 the words of life that people need. And so we're praying, God, that now we would hear from you. We really want to. And so students, I just wanna give you a chance right where you are. Would you just ask the Lord, God, would you speak to me tonight? Would you help me, God, to hear from you this evening? Take a moment and pray for yourself. And then if you'd be willing, would you just pray for me? I wanna be so bold to ask for it because I think that the text we're in tonight is too important for me to shoulder the burden alone. I need the Lord's help, so pray for me, please. Well, Father, we love you. We really do. And we only love you because Jesus, you have first loved us. And so now as we come to your word, we surrender ourselves before it and we ask, speak something new into our lives that we we might walk away from this evening forever different. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. 
Okay, here's what I wanna do. Uh, I wanna start off with just a question. Uh, I just wanna put it out there and have you actually process through this. What is the one thing in life that you're actually seeking after? Like the one thing that if you were to do a mental evaluation right now, where you are, this isn't a hypothetical scenario, I want you to actually do it. What's the one thing you want? Like what's the one thing that it tops everything else? It is your top priority in life. What's the one thing that you're seeking after? You got it? So for my wife and I, when we moved to Houston, Texas, we knew what we wanted. We were united. We were like, okay, we have done apartment life for so long. We wanna buy a house. And so we had never purchased a home before, but we knew, we were like, okay, listen, uh, we did the apartment thing, it was great, but we are not wasting any time. We are gonna hit the ground running and we are gonna buy a home. And so we got to Houston and we changed everything about our lives so that we could get the home that we had longed for, the perfect starter. And so what did that look like? It looked like the two of us, every morning and every evening, committing so much of our life to Zillow and Har, these two housing apps. Uh, literally uh, did them after my quiet time and then before my prayers, before I went to sleep. But they were regimented, man. Like we spent so much time, hours a day, looking at horror, Zillow. We took, we took home buying classes. We learned about financing options. We did all the stuff that you would not normally do because we cared so much about trying to get into, home, into a home. It was our top priority. You see, we knew what our utmost priority was. And because of it, it changed the way in which we lived our life. Our entire world revolved around the fact that we wanted to find not just a home, but the perfect home, the right home, a place where we could feel safe, comfortable, maybe a little too comfortable at times, according to my wife, and happy. You see, I think the reason I share that is because for all of you, you may in fact be looking for a home yourself. Not not realistically, maybe you are, but I think that all of us are, are house shopping at some level. You see, all of us are looking for some place to call home. But instead of actually looking for the right place, what we more often than not do is we, we kind of couch surf. We kind of move through life and because our priorities are constantly shifting because of our age or the school that we're in or trying to move out of our parents' home and distance ourselves from family or trying to find love while in college, what we find ourselves doing is is moving from one priority to the next. And so we never actually find the right place to call home. And yet here's what I would propose, that when you meet Jesus, priorities, they stop shifting. Like the target, it quits moving, you quit couch surfing and you actually find the right place to call home. I believe it's true for the followers of Jesus that this is the case, that we can simplify our seeking to one thing, to knowing Jesus. Because here's what's amazing. When you know Jesus, you'll actually love Jesus. And when you love Jesus, you'll live your life for him. That's just the way it works. It's that simple. And so with all of that said, here's what I want to do in our time together. I want to point you towards the one thing that you should seek after. Like as you think about, man, you're in a season of life, four years here at college, where the world is telling you, hey, everything's about to change. You need to get your priorities straight. Let me just tell you, there's one thing that tops them all. There's one priority that matters most. And it's right here in Psalm 27. We just read it, but the verse we're gonna focus in on is verse four. And the reason why I'm so passionate about this verse is because just being honest with you, there's not a single verse in the Bible over the course of the last year that has done a bigger number on me in the last year. Like this is it. This is the verse that has marked my development over the course of the last year. And I believe if it can be impactful for me, it might it might be impactful for you. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, We're just gonna walk through it verse by verse, okay? We'll start in Psalm 27, verse four. It says this, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing, like David is is very clear. There's one thing that he's asking of the Lord. One thing that he's actually seeking after. So let's just be honest with ourselves. Uh, If you had the chance to stand before the Lord and you're like, hey God, uh, can can I present a request? Can I ask you for something? Would you actually have just one thing that you would wanna ask him? Real talk, like would you really be able to narrow it down to one singular thing? For David, he's able to do it. Like he is a, 
is not only the, the author of this psalm, but he is the king of Israel. He is pulled in so many different directions, stretched so thin. And yet, because of all, yet despite all of the attention that is demanding in his life, he's able to look at the Lord and say, no, there's one thing that I want, God. And if David can do it, we can do it too. You see, life is demanding your attention, but please don't, don't miss this. Life is demanding your attention, but your attention is commanding your life. What do I mean by that? It's like when you go to HEB, when you roll up into the grocery store. What is the worst thing you can do when you go to HEB? You walk in without any kind of plan. And so you expose yourself in vulnerability to all the temptation of the aisles around you. And as you do, what you find is everything's demanding your attention. Like everything's like, pick me. And you're not supposed to do it because what happens when you do is you blow your budget and you gain some unwanted weight. We don't want for that. So how do you approach the grocery store? You walk into it with a list in hand. You've premeditated and you've thought, there are things that are deserving of my attention. And because I've been able to determine what does actually deserve my attention, my attention is now trustworthy to drive my decisions. It's the same in life. Like there are certain things that we should prioritize above all else. And according to David in this passage, there's not only certain things that we should prioritize above everything else. There's one thing that deserves to be prioritized above everything else. And so what is it? He tells us it's to dwell in the house of the Lord. And not just to dwell in the house of the Lord, but to do it all the days of your life. That's what he wants. That's what we should want. Because you see, God's presence is the priority. God's presence is the priority. Like David just wants to be with God. That's all he wants for. Like, I don't know if you know what the house of the Lord is, but in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the temple, it's where the presence of God abided. And David's saying, hey, God, if that's where you're at, can I move in? Like, can I come and can I be with you always? You're the only thing that I want. I've had my taste of everything in the world as king. I've seen all that I would long to look upon. And yet God, as I've seen it all and I've tasted it all, you're the only thing that actually satisfies. You're the only thing that I truly want. And what's amazing is David is so confident in this that he doesn't just say, God, I want to dwell in your home. He says, no, there's one thing that I ask that I may dwell all the days of my life. Like David is speaking in absolutes. He's so confident, so bold, because he knows this is where life is found. This is what's worthy of seeking after. And if David thinks it's worthy of seeking after, I think we should too. And so what we'll find as we work through this together is that David's gonna give us two reasons to seek God's presence and then two results from being in God's presence. Two reasons, two results. And to start, the reasons are right here in verse four. Like they're all packed right here in this one verse. And so let's just read it again together. It says, one thing I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see, he desires to dwell in the house of the Lord to, reason number one, gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to see the beauty of God's character. That's the first reason. That's why we desire it. So when I worked here at Breakaway, um, I spent a lot of time, obviously, around college students, people like yourself. And what I found as I spent time around college students is, yes, like you're undergoing massive life transition. Like, think about it. Think about everything you've incurred since you came to school. Your four years are jam-packed. Like you have moved out of your parents' home. You have traveled to a new and unknown city, unless you're here from College Station. Uh, you have decided, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And you might be looking for love. And you might find it, uh, we don't know. But what I found, especially on the topic of love, is that whenever dating entered into the picture, things would get really interesting. Uh, I ran with a group of guys, group, group of guys that I personally discipled. And what I found is that when the topic of dating came up, it was always interesting because inevitably, as I learned that they were, they were inclined towards some young woman, it would prompt me to move towards a series of carefully crafted, meticulously perfected questions that I ask young men in this type of situation. Question number one, very simply, is who is she? Who is she? What's her name? Simple, right? Question number two is how did you meet? How did you actually find 
one another, which I was always surprised. So often it was Instagram of all places. You're laughing because you do it. Uh, Instagram, like I didn't realize that this was actually fertile ground for finding a suitable spouse. Uh, It's not a dating app. Like the difference in a dating app in Instagram is on a dating app, people are actually soliciting to romantic inquiries. On Instagram, it's like the wild west. Like you just show up, you shoot your shot at whatever kind of pulls your eye and then you see if you actually hit your target. Like that's just kind of the way in which Instagram works. And so whenever I would find out that one of my guys was, was, was interested in some young lady from Instagram, it would always prompt me to question number three, which is, what do you know about her? What do you actually know about her? Now, this is when the nervous energy was palpable because I would get the chance to see them kind of squirm in their seat as they thought about, man, what do I actually know? You know, okay, actually there's a Bible verse in her profile. She's a frequenter of coffee shops and it's clear, man, like she, she has several mutual friends that I, I, I share in common with her as if these three things were actually a suitable criteria, a suitable resume for romantic viability. Now I'm not knocking on Instagram. But what I would say is this, after I was able to pierce through, what do you actually know about her? My fourth and final question was always so simple. You just think she's pretty, don't you? Now I can't speak to the success rate of sliding into someone's DMs, but what I can say is this, tangible beauty, what you see, tangible beauty may spark your interest but intangible beauty will hold your attention. Let me say it again. Tangible beauty may spark your interest, but intangible beauty, it will hold your attention. For my guys, many of them, they would walk into date number one so excited, and then they would walk out of date number one somewhat disappointed. You see, because they realized that, man, though what they initially saw excited them so much, they found that, man, without character, intangible beauty The relationship had no staying power. And so it raises raises an important question. What makes something beautiful? Like what makes something beautiful? There's an old saying that beauty lies in the eye of the beholder, which we could all agree is true. Like beauty is, is according to general standard, like it's subjective. Like if you think it's beautiful, then hey, that's your opinion. The one place where it's not subjective, where it is objectively true is God. God is objectively beautiful, objectively beautiful. What determines if God is beautiful is not what you see of him, but how much of him you actually see. If you don't see God as beautiful, you haven't looked long enough. You haven't looked deep enough because the Lord is beautiful. He is not, his beauty is not determined by what we see of him, but how much of him we see. Because in his character, he possesses everything that is desirable, everything. So just imagine, finding something or someone in life so beautiful that that it would mesmerize you forever, that it would hold your attention with ease and for always. Like ladies, it is a high compliment for a young man to look at you and say, I could stare at you all day. (laughs) But maybe you should ask him, what about tomorrow? Or like maybe what about the day after that or the day following? Can you still stare that long into the future? Because listen, like everybody is fading. Beauty is fleeting, but not when it comes to the Lord. This is why David, he wants to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. He wants to be as close to God as possible so he can gaze as long as possible upon God without any distraction to deter him from it. The second reason we seek the presence of God is this. Uh, We seek the presence of God to know God personally. That's the second reason. It says, like we, it says in verse four that part of David's reason for dwelling in the house of the Lord was to inquire in his temple. That word inquire, when you read it in Hebrew, it's interesting. It carries the idea of not just knowing about someone, but endeavoring to know someone, like seeking, putting action behind your desire to get to know someone. David is longing to know about the Lord. So something you should know about me to put this into perspective is I have an extremely obsessive personality. 
I'm super, super obsessive. I'm not a mile wide, inch deep kind of guy. I'm not a jack of all trades, master of none type. I have total respect for those of you in the room that are like that. It's just not me. Like that's just not how I operate. My wife tells me, hey, uh, the fact that you're interested in only some things means you're really just disinterested in most things. Uh, but the truth is, I just, I'm obsessive. Like there's things that, that call to my attention and, and that I want to learn as much about as possible. And so what I tell people all the time, like if you wanna know what I'm interested in, all you have to do is go and see what recommended videos are on my YouTube feed. Like if you actually wanna know, like, hey, what's, what's currently holding, occupying Kylan's headspace, uh, you just gotta go look at YouTube. And so I, I went and I gave it a look tonight before I showed up to visit with all of you. So here are the results in no particular order. The number one is golf, the game of golf. Anybody know? Uh, number two, Gordon Ramsay. Uh, number three, workout tips and tricks for all my gym bros in the room. And then the, the fourth, mid-size truck reviews. I'm in the market, all right? Uh, I wanna buy one. Uh, that's it, people. Like, that's what my thought life consists of right now. Outside of ministry, you can talk to me about any of those things, and I promise, we'll vibe. Otherwise, good luck. I'll give you my best effort. I'm obsessive. I inquire to know as much as possible about these few things. David is equally obsessed, not with things so trivial, but with God. Like he wants to know the Lord. He is endeavoring to know God. He is singularly devoted, not divided in his attention. It's not, man, I kind of want some of this and I kind of want you, God. It's no, 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 I don't need anything else. All I need is you, Lord. That's all David wants. He is absolutely unequivocally obsessed. According to his estimation, there's no greater occupation of time than to know God. That's all he wants. Now, real talk, let's just try and wrap our minds around what David is speaking to here. Like what would have to be true of someone for them to hold your attention forever and always? Like what would have to be true of someone? I was thinking about it personally. Like I think that, that someone would have to be unpredictable, ever-changing, and always growing. Like they couldn't stay the same. They would have to always be evolving. And yet here's what's amazing, friends. None of those characteristics are true for God. Like God, God is, is not unpredictable. He's steadfast. Like God's not always growing. He is already complete. In the Lord, he's not ever changing. His word is clear. He is unchangeable. You see, God will never change. He will never grow. He will never waver. Because if he were to do any of those things, it would imply that there is some deficiency in him. And there's no deficiency in the Lord. God is, is completely perfect, infinitely deep, inexhaustibly wonderful. Psalm 145.3, it says this, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness, it's unsearchable. You will never find the end of it. He is so great, you will search a lifetime and into eternity long and you'll never see the end of it. Isaiah 40, 28 have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint nor grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Good luck, friends. Get to searching. Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. And here's what's amazing. He is that transcendent, that almighty, that uncontainable. And he invites you to know him. Like we have no business, no right to know a God like that. And yet he says, no, no, no. You could never ascend to the heights of heaven to meet me, to know me. And yet I will stoop low in the form of a man named Jesus, the son of God, so that you might know exactly how I am. We see this, that Jesus, he is our revelation of the father. Hebrews 1, 3, 
He, talking about Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God. And he is the exact imprint of his nature. If you want to know the character and nature of God, look at Jesus. You'll find everything you long for. Colossians 1, 15 and then 19. He, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. God, it'd be great if you'd show up. He did. He's the image of God, the invisible God. Jesus is the one you've been looking for. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Think about that. In Jesus, all the fullness of God. Why didn't it just say, for in him, all of God was pleased to dwell? Or in him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Why does it say all the fullness? All that God is in the fullness of God's character. How wide God is and how deep God is. All of it is contained in Jesus. If you want to get to know him, you look no further than Christ. That's where you'll find your answers. He is both personal and he is beautiful. And he's worthy of seeking. So say we do this. Say we prioritize seeking the presence of God. Like say we, we go all in, we give everything we have. We, we commit our entire life, just like David shows us in this passage to knowing and, and gazing upon the beauty of God. What then takes place? Like what then happens to all of us? Well, there were two reasons. Now there's two results. Two results to being in the presence of God. You see in the presence of God, what we learn is that God gives unexpected provision. That when you're in the presence of God, God's presence, it gives unexpected provision. That with him, you will find things the likes of which you never knew you needed. Psalm 27, one through three, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. You see, the first result of being in God's presence is fearlessness. It's fearlessness. Another way to think about it is this, that nearness to God equals fearless in life. Nearness to God will make you fearless in life. Like it says this in 1 John, it says uh, uh, that, that there is no fear in love, but instead perfect love casts out fear. God is love. There is no fear where he is. And so if you are in his presence, there is no fear there for you either. So just this past December, uh, my wife and I, we took a cruise out of Galveston. We're not big cruisers, but uh, we got a free cruise and we're like, all right, hey, let's do it. So we jumped on a boat. Uh, we headed out of Galveston. We had several ports that we were going to, one of which was Belize. Never been to Belize, didn't really know what to expect, but I knew that it was like, it was a Caribbean jungle. So I got pretty in. I was like, all right, this sounds pretty awesome. And so uh, we get on the boat, we're headed that direction. And what we found is that the days passed along and the next thing we know, we looked up and it's like, oh my gosh, hey, uh, we're going to Belize tomorrow and we have no plans. Like we don't know what we're doing with our time. And so we decide in our infinite wisdom, let's go talk to the shore excursion uh, concierge. So we go downstairs, we visit with the concierge. We're like, hey, uh, what do we need to know about Belize? We're really interested in taking it trip? Is there anything available? She's like, there's nothing available here. Great. Perfect. Uh, So any advice on going ashore in Belize? She says, there's two things you need to know about Belize. Number one, do not go ashore if you don't have an excursion booked with us. Thank you very much. Number two, if you are not back on the boat by the time in which we depart, we will leave you behind. Perfect. So what did we do? Uh, we booked an excursion on Expedia. We weren't going to miss the chance. We were like, man, you know, uh, there's a jungle out there. There's a boat right here. We've been living on this thing for several days. Let's get the heck off. And so we got on the ferry the next morning. We made our way over to Belize. And what we found as we came to the town's city square is that there's this one area where all the tourist agencies, they pick up all of the tourists as they come ashore. And so we show up. And again, we booked this the night before. Payment went through. We got the confirmation email. We're hopeful. And so we get there and our worst nightmares realized. Our, tour, our, our tourism agency is nowhere to be found. Like the people that took our money and promised us an excursion were not there to meet us. Instead, we were left in the persuasive hands of one Captain Tom. 
Uh, Captain Tom looks to prey on uh, innocent, vulnerable young tourists like my wife and I, people that have never been to Belize. And yet he sees the two of us and he's like, yes, those are my people. So he walks up and he says, hey, uh, it looks like you may be in need of an excursion. Is that right? Yes, uh, that is actually right, Captain Tom. Uh, hey, well, what were you signing up to do? We were trying to do cave tubing and zip lining through the jungle. Perfect, I have just the excursion for you. Okay, great. How much does it cost? It costs a fraction of what you would have paid with the other agency. That's good news for you. I guess that is good news. Uh, what do you think? You feel good? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so we gave Captain Tom our money. And Captain Tom immediately, he proceeds to go and to get a van and to pull around so that he can load us up. Now, let me just say, uh, this van, to put it nicely, was disquieting in appearance. I didn't know what awaited us inside of this van, but I knew that I was not prompted to get inside. So we just sat down on the curb. Uh, he's like, no, 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 like load up. I, Captain Tom, like you told us some other people were gonna be arriving. Do you know what time they're gonna be showing up? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they're in the town square. They'll be here in five minutes. Perfect. We're gonna sit right here on this curb until other people show up. And so we sat there. And yet we eventually took the excursion and we had a great time. <laughs> Captain Tom was the real deal, man. If ever you're in Belize, look him up. Love to pass along his information. He'll cut you a mean deal. Uh, but here's, here's why we were able to take the excursion. Because the presence of someone we trusted showed up in a fearful moment. You see, we had fellow shipmates that were wanting to take this excursion too. And in fact, there was one crew, like there was one crew member from our boat that had actually done, done excursions with this tourist agency anyways. So he shows up and it's like, man, you can speak into this situation and you can help us quiet our fears. You see, our nearness to this group of people, it made us fearless for the day. And as a result, we could stop focusing on the possibility of perils and we could actually enjoy the adventure that laid before us. I tell you all that because in life, the same is true with God. Nearness to him will make you fearless in life. Like just look at the way David describes the Lord as he knows him. He says these things. He says, the Lord is my light, my salvation and my stronghold. Why does David call the Lord those three things? Like the Lord is my light. Well, for David to know God is light it meant that God was there when it was dark. For David to call the Lord my stronghold, it means that, that God was there in the face of disaster. For him to say, the Lord is my salvation, it meant that the Lord was there in the face of danger. God was there in every circumstance through which David lived. When things got bad, David was not alone. When things grew fearful, David could count on the Lord. God had proven himself trustworthy in the past. And so David knew, I can count on you to be capable in the future. And nearness to God, fearless in life. Charles Spurgeon, he once said this, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Charles Spurgeon learned that man, any adversity I incur in life, it is not, uh, it is not without purpose. God will take it and he will use it to pull me into himself. I have no reason to fear. And the same was true for David. Like what's amazing as he goes on is he says repeatedly that he shall not fear. And yet what you see in this passage is it's in the face of escalating circumstances. So initially it's just general evildoers and then it's adversaries and foes. And then it ramps up again and it says, man, there's an, an army encamped against me. And then at last it says, there's a, a war rising about me. Like things are getting bad, but in the face of worsening odds, David's confidence rises because he knows the Lord. And our confidence can rise also. Because just as David was battle tested, we too will endure our own battles. And as we do, we can trust the Lord to see us through the, through the ones in the future. This is not though the only result of being near the Lord. The second result of being in the presence of God is joy. Joy. Uh, look at verse five with me. It says, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. 
and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I'll offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and I'll make melody to the Lord. David says, now my head shall be lifted up. What causes in life your head to hang low? Think about it. Like what actually causes you to be downcast? I would propose it's one of two things. Sin or circumstances. What does sin yield in life? It brings shame. And some circumstances can actually bring fear. Like those are the two things that will cast your eyes downward, that will cause your head to hang low. And yet here's what we can know, that, that if those things are true, that if sin and circumstances, if those are the things that will, that will serve to, to block us from being near the presence of God, then we have a choice all of our life. It is one of two things. It is either a drawing near or a drifting away from the Lord. All of life, you can draw near to him or you can drift away. There is no neutral option. You can't be neutral. Like you're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. You're either going to the left or you're going to the right. You will draw near to him or you will drift away from him. And yet here's what's amazing. David is saying, hey, it's a good thing that you can't be neutral. Because when you draw near to the Lord, you're promised joy. Like joy is waiting for you there. And don't we all want it? Like David's saying, hey, I don't need to cower in fear because God has lifted me high upon a rock. I don't need to hide in shame because God has lifted my head and said, I can rejoice. I can offer shouts of praise in his tent. That tent that David is talking about, it's a reference to the tent of meeting. In the Old Testament, Moses would enter into the tent of meeting so that he could draw close to the Lord. David is saying, hey, I want to get as close to you, God, as possible because the intensity of your joy depends upon your proximity to God. The intensity of your joy, it depends on your proximity to God. He says this, David, in another Psalm, Psalm 1611, he says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Friends, if this isn't sufficient reason to draw near to God, then I don't know what is. What else could you want for than fullness in joy? It's promised in his presence. And yet for many of us, while we might agree with this in theory, yeah, man, like God is, is, he's the essence of joy. Where he is is where joy is found. While we might agree with this in theory, if we did an honest assessment of our lives, would your decisions agree with what you claim to know? Like, let's just be really honest about it. Like when it comes to joy, you have two options. You can either seek after it or you can search for it. What's the difference in seeking and searching? Seeking implies that you know where to find it. Searching suggests you don't know where to begin. You can seek joy in the presence of God. That's where it's found. Or you can search for it in all manner of other places. And honestly, I was thinking about this point coming into tonight. The best thing some of you could do is evaluate where are you searching for joy? Because listen, like I just wanna be a friend to you. I just wanna tell you the honest truth. If you're not seeking for it in God, then you are being duped into thinking you will find it somewhere else and you won't. Like some of you, you think you will find it by the approval of some guy. And so you're willing to reduce your intrinsic value, make compromising decisions so that he'll embrace you. Others of you, like you want so bad for the acceptance of your friends. And so you're willing to, to compromise your character by making decisions that you know you shouldn't. And others like you, you want for comfort. And so you willingly succumb to the pangs of addiction, porn, food, sex, alcohol. I don't know what it is, but you'll tip a bottle. You'll search and then delete your browsing history because you can't get over the itch 
of wanting some comfort that you think that addiction, that, some, that substance will actually provide. Friends, those places, they will not give you joy. They will steal it from you. They do not have your best interest at heart. There is only one place where joy is found and it is in the presence of God. And what's amazing is the Lord is saying, hey, I will give freely to all if they would come to me. I have full joy to offer. So last story and I'll finish up. A few weeks ago, uh, I was at a retreat for a ministry in Oklahoma that's similar to, to Breakaway. It's actually, it's on the, campus to, uh, on the campus of OU. And so I'm there and uh, they're coming to the SEC. Okay, like they're gonna get what's coming for them. <laughs> it's a really special retreat. Like we're spending, it's just two days, it's three sessions. They've asked me to come and speak. And so I'm hanging out with these students, just like yourself on another campus. And, and we wrap the third session and and I finish and I'm just like, hey, uh, if you need to pray with anybody, like I'm gonna be in the back of the room, you can come find me, I'd love to pray with you. And so we wrap, I pray, I, I head down off the stage, I make my way to the back of the room and, and some people like they kind of come back, they pray with me, they wanna process through some things, which is so good, like take action on it if the Lord is moving. And yet I'll never forget, there was one young lady who came up to me and I could tell like she had been crying, she had been dealing with the Lord, wrestling, through some conviction that the spirit had been bringing. And as she stood there and she looked at me, she said, Kylan, listen, like I, I've been living my life in two different worlds, in two different camps. I've been trying to follow Jesus and yet I'm giving all of myself away to the things of this world. Like I'm so split. And I feel like in this moment, I'm just supposed to surrender. Like I've, I've felt the call of God beckoning me to come back, but tonight I hear it clear and I wanna come home. I wanna surrender to him. And so I'm like, that's amazing. Like, let's pray right now. And so I lay a hand on her shoulder and we pray together. And as we wrap up again, like you can just hear, like she's, she's sniffling because this, this is real for her. Like this isn't some emotionally drummed up moment. Like she's making a conscious decision to follow the Lord. And so we say amen and I look at her and she, she starts to walk off and I'm like, hey, 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 listen, I know you live here in Oklahoma and I live in Houston. We are miles apart. And yet if I can ever do anything for you, I'd love to do it. And she looks at me, she says, you know, I'm not actually a student at Oklahoma. I'm from Houston. And I feel like the Lord sent you to get me. Friends, that says nothing about me, but it says everything about the heart of God to seek you. You see, David is saying, man, all I want is to dwell in the house of the Lord. I wanna be with you, God. God has looked from eternity past and into eternity future. And he's saying, hey, all that I've ever wanted is to dwell with you. Like, I wanna be with you. No one seeks God without God first seeking them. No one. That's the gospel, like Jesus Christ. He descended from heaven on high so that we could see in him the beauty of God's character. And as he came and he revealed us, revealed to us himself and he taught us according to his word, we got the chance to know him personally. And as he showed us, hey, this is how beautiful God is. This is how relational, personal God is. What Jesus did is he looked upon you and I, people that could not make our way back to the Lord. And he said, I will take all of the consequence of your sin, the very thing that keeps you from God, and I will bear it upon myself. I will hang myself on a Roman execution rack, bearing a gruesome death for the sake of people that God wants to seek after and dwell with forever. Friends, he is seeking you. He is seeking you. He is seeking you. He wants to be with you. The question is simply, do you want to be with him? 
there is no priority greater than to seek the Lord. One thing I ask, one thing I seek after, it's to be with you, God. Will you seek after it starting tonight?